Have you ever been in a situation where you put your best efforts forward, but it just wasn't enough? Where you did all you possibly could, but there was no headway? I have come to tell you today, dare to believe in God, even if you don't know how he's going to help you. He is an expert in impossible situations, and he has never failed in any of his previous endeavors. You can trust God to provide for your needs. Don't limit God. Trust him for the impossible. In John 6, Jesus and his disciples ascend a mountain where they are joined by a large crowd eager to hear what they had to say. There is no doubt that these people had made the long journey to hear him speak. Jesus asked Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? After he lifted up his eyes and saw the large crowd approach him in John 6 verse 5, the Bible tells us Jesus already had a plan in place for feeding the large crowd. Here is how the Bible put it. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You see, God isn't scratching his head over how he's going to take care of you while he sits on the throne. The money may not be coming in as quickly or as much as you'd hoped. The job may not be given in the timeline you want, but have faith in God. He knows exactly what he's doing. He will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory as your Jehovah Jireh. 200 pennies worth of bread is not enough for them, that each one of them may take a little. Philip replied to Jesus in verse 7. As a result, Philip was arguing with Jesus that they couldn't afford to feed such a large group. About 5,000 men were in the group. As far as his calculations were concerned, it was a non-starter. Then Andrew, another of Jesus' disciples, stepped in and told them about a little boy. Among the multitudes, there is a youngster who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Yet, their first thought was how that would help them. Andrew, too, wondered how five loaves would be sufficient for a crowd. In their midst was the miracle worker, but they had forgotten. They almost missed an opportunity because they were so focused on their limited resources. Is that something you've ever done? It's fine to think and calculate, but don't get bogged down in that. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. God is your source of nourishment and provision. He has the ability to find a solution even when none seems possible. While you may be in debt, he will still deliver. Call on him and he will respond and reveal great and mighty things that you don't even know. Child of God, rather than focusing on the impossibilities, why not take time to thank God? We must have an attitude of gratitude. In John 6, 10 through 11, Jesus instructs, make the men sit down. The area had a lot of grass now. About 5,000 men took their places at the table. It was then that Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks. And after that, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those who had been set down. And he also gave the fishes to those who had been set down as well. Notice how Jesus' demeanor was vastly different from that of the disciples. Because of this, he didn't have any doubts or complaints, but instead expressed his gratitude. Unbelief and negative speech can obstruct our miracles at times. Some of us are not careful enough to watch our tongue. We complain and complain till we forget that our God can do the impossible. More than that, he cares for us. It's time to face the facts. Some religious people go overboard 
with their positive declarations. Once we've completed our calculations and analysis, it's time to look to the sky because we have help from above. Remember Psalms 121, one through two, says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Before the bread was broken and blessed, Jesus gave thanks to God for all of his blessings. Before God blesses you, he may have to break you first. He may put you through a vetting process before promoting you. Before he can put his full faith in you, he wants to see that you can handle the little things. Even if you only have a few cents, thank God for what you do have. You need to stop dwelling on your shortcomings. Put your faith in Jesus and shift your perspective. Give thanks to God with your hands raised high in the air. Tell it to the world, even if I don't have all the things I want, I have what I need. Praise God for what he has done in your life right now. Request his pardon for your whining. Put an end to your anxiety. You cannot solve your own problems. If you could, there wouldn't be a need for God in the first place. Staying anxious only limits God. Listen, it's not up to you to figure it out because that's not what God wants. He simply wants you to put your faith in him because he cares about you. You can give him your worries. First Peter five verse seven says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Child of God, understand that obedience is essential for success. Jesus thanked God for the five loaves and two fishes before breaking them and giving them to his disciples so that they could distribute them to those in need. When Jesus thanked God for the little things, Philip must have thought it was admirable. But now there he stood in front of over 20,000 people holding only a piece of bread. Try to imagine what the first man looked like as Philip made his way slowly toward him, as he handed out the first, second, and third pieces. You can only imagine Philip's trepidation. Five loaves for every two additional people would be distributed. Jesus, on the other hand, did not anticipate his followers multiplying the food. He merely asked them to follow his instructions. Taking a step of faith is all God wants from you. So go for it. Don't go by what you see. You must remove the stone in order for God to raise your Lazarus from the dead. The disciples obeyed and fed all those people. A lot of good things happened. In each case, Philip approached a new person and returned to his basket to find that it was already full. Sure, he was ecstatic at this point. His faith was reviving. Even though they should have run out of food by this point, they hadn't. I can picture Jesus smirking as he observes them. Andrew's confidence grew as he walked around. Asked if anybody wanted more. Anyone want seconds, he began, his head held high. In the end, there's enough for everyone. When God is working in our favor, we can be a lot more confident. In the beginning, we have faith as small as a mustard seed that grows into an ocean. Verse 12 of John 6 says, When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. God is not a fan of wasting anything. He who deals with a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent makes rich says the Bible in Proverbs 10, verse four. Make the most of what you have. Make the most of it before it's too late. Consequently, they gathered them all together and gathered 12 baskets of the remaining fragments of the five barley loaves, which had been eaten by those who had not yet done so. Jesus fed over 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. Also, no one stopped eating until they were satisfied. There was even some left over. 
Isn't it wonderful that we serve such a loving God? Don't limit him. Even if you only have two fish and five loaves of bread, the power of God can make anything possible. He has the ability to accomplish the impossible. For him, nothing is impossible. Have faith in him. You can expect an out of this world increase from him. Let God do what he does best and don't limit him. While Joseph had been through a great deal in his life, his faith was unwavering. He had previously been rejected by his family. He was kidnapped and sold into slavery, then framed and imprisoned, all of which led him to believe, even at the point of death, that God's promises had been fulfilled in his life. Genesis 50, 24 through 25 says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land. He promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid. And then you must carry my bones up from this place. Joseph lived to be a ripe old age of 110. He was then transported to Egypt, where he was embalmed, and interred in a tomb. As soon as the Exodus arrived, Joseph's body was exhumed and taken to the land of Canaan, where he was laid to rest 400 years later, after spending 360 years buried there. God would do what he had said he would do, and Joseph knew this well. So he wanted to be there when it happened. He knew this for a fact. However long it might take, he was confident that it would happen and referred to his bones rather than his ashes. Again, he was close to death and most people tend to think about other things at that time. Then he made plans and provisions for the time when God would carry out what he had promised to carry out. Joseph's bones were eventually taken to the promised land and buried there by God's promise. Please. Let us all have the same kind of unwavering faith in God's goodness and provision as this man. Don't limit God. Trust God too much to give up on your miracle. He can do the impossible. It is just a matter of time. In order for me to communicate this message to you properly today, I knew I had to put myself in your shoes. I knew I had to be honest with myself about one thing. It can be quite difficult to keep believing that God is still working when everything in my life says otherwise. It can be difficult to believe God is still working when things are going well for others, and it seems for me, everything is going downhill. Maybe you have been praying about something, and instead of getting better, it just keeps getting worse. How do you believe God is still working in such a situation? Believe me, I know what it feels like to be in such a situation. However, I want to say this to you. Dare to believe God still. No matter where we are, the greatest good we can do ourselves is to keep believing that God is for us. Look, the world today doesn't encourage you to believe God, to trust the process of His working, doesn't want you standing on God's promises, it will push you so hard that you will begin to think God is actually against you. The world wants you to take control of your life by yourself. It wants you to suit up and go play your own hero. However, dear child of God, you belong to God. Your destiny is in His hands. You are so dear to Him that He considers it unrighteous to forget you. See how the following verses puts it. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 through 16. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are even before me. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. 
God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Maybe you are sitting there right now looking at your life or situation and it seems nothing is happening. I want you to know without any shadow of doubt that even in that moment when it feels like nothing is happening, God is still working in the background. Remember what he has said in his word over every child of his. He has a plan for our destinies. And, though it may not look like it right now, that plan is to do you good. I don't know how. I can't even say I know what he is doing exactly. But allow me to encourage you with these words. Dare to keep believing God. Do you know that even before you started believing him, God already had you in mind? He had already begun working things out to save you even while you were yet to come to Him. Think about that for a moment. The Bible says that even while we, you and I, were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave His Son to save you even before you acknowledged Him in your life. Before you stepped towards Him, He was already running towards you. Before you called out to Him, He had stretched out His hands towards you. Now, think for a moment. If he went this far to save you, do you think he would do all that to leave you the way you are or where you are right now? Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Many times we forget this very important information, but I am glad you are seeing this today. Be reminded. Even when it doesn't look like it, God is still working. When it seems you have been applying for the job and no one wants to employ you, God is still working on your behalf. When it seems like you've been working and working, giving it your best, and no one seems to appreciate or even recognize you, God is still working. When it seems like your life is characterized by failure everywhere you turn, God is still working on your behalf. Listen, you don't need to understand all the details. Find strength in these words. God will never fail you. Even if it looks like he has, he never will. Can you imagine yourself in Joseph's shoes? Imagine yourself with all your dreams and visions and goals, running through life with the excitement of achieving them all. And then, like a pack of cards, everything comes crashing down. Imagine how Joseph must have felt when his own brothers were planning to kill him before they finally agreed to sell him into slavery. Imagine yourself in Joseph's place when he was reduced from the status of a rich kid, almost like a prince, to a slave in a strange land far away from home. He could not write a letter to his father. There was no phone to contact home. You would feel lost and alone, abandoned in such a situation. And even when things seemed to calm down a little and he was doing well in his master's house, he was framed by the master's wife and sent to prison without trial. Remember that this same Joseph refused to sin with Potiphar's wife because of his fear for God. Genesis chapter 39 verses 7 through 9. And after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He was very conscious about pleasing God, but his own life would beg the question, where was God in all of this? Why didn't God exonerate him from all their accusations? Why did God allow him to go to prison? Where was God when he was being wrongly accused and then sent into the prison? But, you see, dear friend, we would fail to see God if we are so much in a haste, wanting everything the way we want. But if you look closely from the beginning, through the middle, and at the end of Joseph's life, God was involved. Even in his master's house, the Bible said that God was with him and granted him favor, making everything he did to prosper. Though it was a house of bondage, he still prospered there. He was exempted from the sufferings of the other servants. Most servants would have been killed, 
but God made it so that they would jail him instead. Why? Because Joseph was in line with the blueprint. God was working in the background. Everything was going according to plan. Even while in prison, God was with him and granted him favor. Look, how do I know? God is always working and was working in Joseph's life even in this situation. It was no coincidence that Joseph got incarcerated in the royal prison. It was no coincidence that Pharaoh's servants offended him and he had them thrown into the same royal prison where Joseph was being held. It was no coincidence that both had a problem in that prison that only Joseph could solve. It was also no coincidence that Joseph's interpretation was spot on and happened just like he said it would. That is not all, my friend. Remember, I said, even when it doesn't look like it, God is still working. You must dare to keep believing. After all that happened, everything went back to the way they used to be. The servant was set free and he forgot Joseph. I would like to believe that God allowed him to forget. Why? Because according to his plans, if they released Joseph at once, he would not occupy the position God was preparing him for. Maybe he would become another servant, and God had something else in mind. Joseph was not meant to be a servant all his life. It was his destiny to rule, and everything was already in motion to bring him to that destiny. So, God made the servant forget Joseph for a while. It may have felt painful to help someone and be forgotten, but don't forget, God is still working. Don't conclude on your destiny when God hasn't. Dare to believe Him, no matter what. Then fast forward to a couple years later. Now it was time for Joseph's manifestation. It was time for his revelation, and for that to happen, there must be a grand entry. So what did God do? He allowed a problem to surface which only Joseph could solve. Pharaoh had a dream that no one of his wise men could solve. This was the time that the servant remembered Joseph. Do you see it? Everything that Joseph had done and had gone through was preparing him for this grand moment. This was the moment of his life, and oh boy, was he ready. Hear how the psalmist wrote about it. Psalms 105, verses 18 through 22. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The ruler of people set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. You know the rest of the story. Joseph told the interpretation and added wise instruction to it. This pleased the king and all who witnessed Joseph. This was how he was promoted to become Egypt's prime minister under Pharaoh. However, in the grand scheme of things, God was fulfilling a plan through the destiny of Joseph that would save not only the Egyptian nation, but the Israelite race and other nations that would benefit from it during the famine. I don't know what you are going through or where you are right now. However, I want to plead with you, do not stop believing God. It is not your job to figure out how God answers or will answer you. It is not your job to know when He will answer you. He has given you one job, and that is to just believe. Jesus said in Mark chapter 5, verse 36, Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Only believe, my friend. Don't stop believing. There's something I always tell people, and I believe this is a great time to tell you because what you hear is as important in influencing what you believe. I tell people, if you have strength for one more step, place it in front of you. God will never go back on what He has promised you if you keep your eyes and heart on Him. God is still healing the sick, my friend. Don't stop believing this. God is still raising the dead back to life. Don't stop believing this. God is still changing stories from shame to honor. Don't stop believing. God is still turning lives around. What do you need to do? Keep believing. If you will keep believing, you will reach the finish line. If you are struggling with believing God at the season of your life, I would like to encourage you to ask for his help right now. Like the father of that sick child in the Bible, honestly tell him, Father, I believe you. I want to believe you more than I do right now. 
Please help my unbelief. If there is any in me, help me to hope against all hope. Help me to believe against every doubt. I know you always hear me, and you will deliver me from this situation as you did Joseph. I will believe you. I will trust you for as long as I live, and I know that one day soon, all you promised me will come to pass. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't give up hope, dear child of God. God is still working miracles. Keep believing. All things are possible to those who believe. God inscribes a purpose for each of our lives in the palm of His hand. That dream will come true if we put our trust in Him and follow through on what He says. There are always a lot of thorns and thickets along the way to our goal. Nothing worthwhile ever comes easily or without challenge. Thunderstorms will roll in, lions will howl, and we'll face our worst fears. It is God's will that the path be difficult so that we can be refined and prepared for our promised land. He's here to get what our adversary would love to use against us, and he intends to take it from us. Because God cares so much about us, he won't promote us until we're ready. The Valley of Decisions will be a place we find ourselves in as we follow his lead. The place is a death trap. Dreams, too, are slain there. People's flesh is tough to deal with. So many have chosen to let their dreams die before confronting their own. Inconsistencies and weaknesses are inherent to our personalities. We will need Jesus' direction and correction until we see Him face to face. He wants us to go from strength to strength and from glory to glory. This is His goal. Ephesians 3.20 says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. This verse is a clincher. He wants to do more than we could ever ask or think, but it's based on his work in us. To the extent that we allow him to work in and through us, we will be able to accomplish great things. Think about it for a while and imagine a valley of dried bones the bones of marriages, relationships, and abandoned dreams because many people were unwilling to die to themselves and humble themselves and let God have His way in their lives in the valley. During a period of refinement, it's best to hunker down. You can rest assured that the loving hand of your precious Savior will guide you to the other side. Dear believer, deny yourself the right to a sense of entitlement and the expectation that you will be understood in return. Allow God to work in your life by being humble and seeking to understand what He's doing. You can rely on Him to lead the way, and you will grow stronger as you follow. A new perspective and new mercies await you on the other side of this purifying period. In time, you will be elevated and honored in front of the entire world if you put your trust in God's mighty hand. How do you know God is using your current situation to help prepare you for a greater blessing? Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden by God, who had just given him life. At this point, the Lord God established a garden in Eden to the east, where he placed the man he had created. It's important to note that God had already finished blessing Adam before he arrived. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is an excellent analogy, in fact. To begin, God took the first five days and made all of God's creations. Gardening is what he did. Flowers and luscious fruit were added to it by him. It was built so that water would flow through it. Onyx, gold, and silver were among the priceless items he buried. There was a blessing waiting for Adam when he arrived. When he didn't get there, he had to work night and day, struggling and thinking, how am I going to live? How will I eat or drink? All around him, he could see trees full of fruit, crystal clear streams, and abundance. He didn't have to worry about how he would support his family or earn a living. 
because he had everything he needed. In the garden, he had all the resources he needed to live a victorious and abundant life. All the right people and circumstances were in place for you when God laid out his plan for your life. Your life is in the hands of God. I tell you, blessings that bear your name are in his possession. If you'll keep your faith and honor God, you'll one day be able to claim what's rightfully yours. It's a blessing in disguise. Hallelujah! In the same way, God has prepared some blessings for you today. He has put in a lot of effort to ensure that everything works out in your favor. On your own, you couldn't accomplish anything. Just God's good will bringing you into a ready blessing. You see, God is in charge of the universe, and He knows exactly how to get you into your own private paradise. No, God has a husband or wife waiting for you. I've been single for so long, I don't think I'll ever meet the right person, you say. As soon as God says, okay, I'm done, here's what I've been working on, everything will be ready to go. You'll meet the one you've been picturing in your head. God, this was so worth the wait, you'll think. Wow, you really went above and beyond. Beautiful thought, right? This is all to tell you not to give up. You may not be able to see it, but God is hard at work in your garden, preparing it for your arrival. You won't believe what God has planned for you, the big blessing He is preparing for you. While you're waiting for God to finish planting your garden, putting in the proper provisions and assembling the right team, you'll be welcomed into it when it's ready for you. A sudden promotion, a contract, better health, and a turnaround in a problem are all possibilities. Luke 137 says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. I can guarantee that your garden will be more impressive than you ever imagined. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water and fountains and springs, flowing forth in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity and have nothing to lack, declares Deuteronomy 8, 7 through 9. In the garden God has prepared for you, there is no shortage of resources, opportunities, creativity, friendships, joy, and peace. You'll never run out of good things to do in your garden. It's easy to focus on what you don't have when you're feeling down. But instead of doing that, try saying these words, Lord, thank you for leading me into my garden, a land where there is no lack, a land where my gifts and talents can shine brightly, or something similar, a good land where I can fulfill my destiny, or something similar, a good land where my whole house can honor you, a garden of abundance filled with favor, opportunity, good health, and great relationships is God's dream for your life. Even if you haven't arrived yet, don't worry, your garden is coming. David said, speaking of God, in Psalms 31, 19, How abundant are the good things you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge, on those who take refuge in you. Wow, glory to God. God has businesses prepared for you that he intends to make available to you soon. There's a promotion waiting for you, good health waiting for you, a new house waiting for you, and a spouse waiting for you. If you truly love the Lord, He will bring you into the plans He has already made for you. The blessings will come to you because you've honored God and been faithful. You don't have to go out and look for them. Something is currently on the prowl for you, not defeat, lack, or bad luck. Favor, contracts, and good health are all searching for you. You're about to see something you've never seen before when you enter your garden. A prepared blessing. The people, places, and opportunities that God has planned for you would astound you, and it would be the surpassing greatness of God's favor to see it all come to fruition. 
Many people make excuses for why they can't achieve their dreams. I don't have the training, talent, connections. My family is from the wrong nationality. I'm too short. I won't be able to enter my garden. When God breathed life into you, He placed a blessing on you that overrides everything that comes against you. This is not a limitation of your circumstances, your family, or anyone else. God is the only one who can stop you from receiving the blessings He has planned for you. Remember that the totality of your life is in His hands. In the garden He has planned for you, you will be welcomed with open arms by Him. When we read the Bible, we think of King David in 1 Samuel 16 as one of the greatest leaders of all time. But David wasn't born into a royal family. He didn't grow up rich, and he wasn't prepared to rule. He came from humble beginnings. His brothers were serving in the military, and David was responsible for caring for his father's sheep. When he was young, his family treated him like a second-class citizen, believing that he would never amount to much. Naturally, David didn't seem to have much hope. He came from an impoverished background, had no formal education, and even his own father didn't think much of him. However, just because others have written you off, it does not follow that God has done the same. God didn't create you to abandon you. No. It may seem as if you're stuck in a rut and will never be able to climb out of it, but that doesn't negate what God has in store for you, the big blessing coming your way. In the end, the blessing you've received from God will prevail. The blessing will make up for any shortcomings, regardless of who was working against you. So relax. It doesn't matter who you are or what's going on around you. God's blessing will allow you to fulfill your destiny. Jesse had a son whom the prophet Samuel would anoint as king over Israel one day. It's possible that you won't be viewed favorably by your family or friends because of your belief in Jesus Christ. Perhaps, like David, you only had a small part of your parents' love. As a reminder, people can become beloved of God even if they're rejected by others. When it comes to receiving your blessing, you don't have to worry about anyone else getting their hands on it. Nobody can take your blessing away from you when the time comes. You didn't deserve it because you worked harder than your coworker. But if you didn't get the promotion, it wasn't yours. No one else will be able to use your oil. No one can take your blessing away from you. It is yours to keep. Nobody else can have what's meant to be yours. The oil won't flow for anyone else if you don't own the house with your name on it. They all have your name on them, the job, the contract, the husband. As a result, you don't need to be concerned or upset. God has your back and no one will take what is rightfully yours. Don't get jealous when you see someone getting a big contract, having a baby, or moving into a new house. That doesn't have your name on it. If it was supposed to be yours, the oil would not have flowed. God has a better plan for you than they do, and you can be happy for them knowing that. Rejoice, for your life is in God's hands, and child of God, I tell you, He is preparing a big blessing for you. Ready yourself. Emotions are hidden attributes of our outward character. There are basic things that control our emotions. Those are our limbic systems. According to the psychologist, the ultimate is God Almighty, the master of the universe. Do your emotions control you or are you controlled by your emotions? When you're in a good emotional disposition, calm and every action you take is geared toward the leadings of the Holy Spirit, you can say that you control your emotions. The Holy Spirit can help control every one of our emotions positively. You are knowledgeable, but are you emotionally stable? Emotions are the generic term for subjective, conscious experiences that are primarily characterized by psychological expressions. 
biological reactions, and mental state. Are you mentally stable in your reaction to social issues in life? Are you able to identify your own emotions and those of others to self-motivate and know how to monitor your emotions and those around you? If you are self-aware, meaning that you know your emotional stability and are able to manage it, it's true. How about that of others who would snap at you at every point in time, talking down at you and making you angry deliberately? Let us look at how to know when we allow our emotions to control or rule us. Are you argumentative? Do you argue over every issue of life? Do you not listen? When you do not listen to other people, you always think you're right and others are wrong. You need to watch it and always pay attention to others too. Do you blame others for your mistakes? There are people who blame everyone but themselves for their mistakes. If you are, you must examine yourself. Turn to God Almighty and ask for assistance. He will come to your aid. Do you experience emotional outbursts? At every given time, you're edgy or cranky, always angry. Before anyone can talk to you, they will first check your outward expressions. You can come out of it and have a positive disposition towards life. God will help with your thoughts and clean them with the word purifier from the Bible. So you'll then be in charge of your emotions. The word of God assures and soothes various challenges of life. It's applicable to emotions and other aspects of life. Read it and pray. It'll go a long way towards helping you. Seek first God's kingdom and righteousness and all other things will be added to it. This is a blank check. Take advantage of it. Check all of the above mentioned items and reconsider seeking spiritual assistance. If you think it's normal to express anger, then check the Bible and have a redress. Who can help you? Only God Almighty can help you and change your emotions into positive expressions and you will have peace. Let us look at Proverbs 16.32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. When you are slow to anger, that is a negative emotional outburst. The Bible says that you're better than the mighty. Let us look at how we know that we control our emotions. You are self-aware. You know your emotional dispositions. You're able to manage it and control it. You have empathy. You feel for others. And you're able to put yourself in others' positions, feel for them, and sympathize with them. You have high self-regulation. You're able to manage yourself and others. Should there be any challenges, you are able to regulate everything without it turning into chaos. You are highly motivated. You're at the top of your game, always highly positive with words of encouragement and enthusiasm, not a moment of giving in to the devil. You challenge yourself, encourage yourself, and support yourself with a positive attitude. What we see creates the behaviors that form our character. We must first check our thoughts. Our thoughts are mostly preoccupied with their negative impact. Never feel your emotions with what you can't control and what you can't help when the repercussions happen. Let us look at negativity, negative emotions like envy. Are you envious of friends or people without even knowing if it's wrong? Envy can kill. Depression is an emotional state in which a person gives up on everything and wishes to end their life. This can also end your life journey, so take it to God. What is depressing you? What is eating you up emotionally? Take it to God Almighty for restoration and everlasting peace. Frustrations. Are you frustrated? You've tried so many things and it seems to not be working. Don't be frustrated. Ask God for help. He will make a way where there is no way. Sadness. Are you downcast? Are you sad about an issue? Take it to God. Guilt. Do you feel guilty over certain issues? Repent and stop hurting yourself. Let it all down on God. This feeling can emanate bad emotions that can affect you. 
grief. Are you grieving over the loss of a friend, family member, or loved one? If this is affecting you negatively, take it to the Most High God who will give you peace of mind. Fear. Is there any false thing projecting fear inside you, causing you fear, affecting your productivity? Take it to God. Shame. What caused you shame? Instead, what is it that you did that makes you feel ashamed? Of allowing your emotions to ride you? Take it to God Almighty and repent never to do it again. He will direct your path and take it away. Do you have doubts about a situation that is beyond you, but you believe it's possible? Take it up with the Most High God. Jealousy. Jealousy can make a person do something that he or she's not expected to do. Negative vibes that can make you sick. It's a negative emotional challenge that needs to be worked on. Disliking people or friends or colleagues for no reason can kill. All these negative emotions do not encourage healthy living. Positive emotions come with great impact, influence from God Almighty. Let us check that too. Smiling, calm heart, happiness, and inner joy. All these things come from God Almighty. Let us look at the scripture. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. The Bible makes it clear that all wrath and anger should be put away, as these are indications that we are not in control of our emotions, but that they are dictating to us. Bitterness can destroy good and fantastic relationships. Just imagine a young boy of 17 who went out with his friend for a dinner and ended up slaughtering her for rituals. What manner of evil is that? This should never be found among us as children of the highest God. Let us look at the description of bad emotions in the Bible. Proverbs 29.11 says, A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. The Bible describes anyone who displays negative emotions as a fool. Are you wise or foolish? A man of wisdom should be preferred to a fool of foolishness. Therefore, we must immediately ask for help from Almighty God. Brethren, if we are in control of our anger, you would know the triggers and limits, and there would be a check-in in your spirit to let you know that you're above board. Control your emotions rather than allowing them to control you. How can you control your emotions? He is the one who can help us without prejudice. First and foremost, you have to ask God for help. Remove negativity from your thoughts. Take it up from your current thought level. What preoccupies your mind? What do you think about when you're alone? Do you magnify or overthink issues? Ponder a little and move on to engage your mind with positive things. Read and listen to good messages from your pastor. Forgive people before the offense occurs. Offenses will come. People around you will deliberately hurt you, but don't over magnify it. Just take it away and let it go. This happens through the help of the Holy Spirit. Take away the murmuring in your thoughts. Do you complain about what you have and don't have? Do you grumble over things? Take it out of your mind so it doesn't affect you negatively. Thank God for everything and you'll see positive change. How do we get rid of toxic emotions? Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. There must be peace with God in your heart, the peace that supersedes all understanding. It is God that gives it. The world can't give it to you. A human being cannot give it to you. The community cannot give it. Only God can give that. He is available to you today. Ask Him for peace of mind. If you have peace, you have everything. Everlasting joy. Embrace emotional healing. You must know what triggers negative emotions and avoid it. Or at every point in time, 
ask the Holy Spirit for help. You must be emotionally intelligent. Negative emotions can come from triggering events, like an overwhelming workload, for example. Negative emotions are also the result of our thoughts surrounding an event. The way we interpret what happened can alter how we experience the event and whether or not it causes stress. There are suggestions that may help or keep you from toxic emotions. You must first of all check what works for you. This helps me greatly. Ask God for help. At this point, you notice wrong expressions of negative emotions. Realize where you are. Take a break. Breathe in and out. Leave the scene of the event or be excused from the conversation. Calm yourself down and reflect on positive memories and successes and reflect on them. Hang out with people who love you. You should enjoy some positive friends in your circle. Hang out with them. To avoid suicide or negative actions that will cause your loved ones pain, avoid being alone. Try something different or new. Take a short walk. Listen to music. Draw or write short stories. Simply do it. Something new. You'll be glad you did. Write down your worries. I did this recently when my children were returning to school and there was no visible cash at hand. I was so disturbed. I prayed, Dear God, please help me. I wrote about what I would need, ranging from tuition, transportation, provisions, etc. I prayed and handed it over to God Almighty. Guess what? I had peace and I had directions to make some calls. God did it. They all went to school and it's a thing of the past now. You must not worry about anything. It can't solve the problem. Rather, it will aggravate it. Write down what's working for you in life. The following may be an addition, but please get what works for you. And finally, make sure you're in control of your emotions rather than your emotions controlling you. You can be a Christian and know very little about the nature and character of God. As a matter of fact, this is where many believers in Christ Jesus are. They are sons and daughters of God, indeed, but they are ignorant of His ways. As a result of this, they make assumptions about God that are largely wrong because such assumptions are not based on understanding the Bible. God's written word. If you want to know God accurately, you must study the Bible. It's not optional. You cannot totally rely on knowledge of another believer. You need to know by yourself and for yourself. This is not difficult because in most parts of the world today, the Bible is accessible even in a variety of formats. There is the audio Bible that you can listen to at your convenience. And there is the e-Bible, soft copy, which can be installed on digital devices such as Android phones, tablets, and laptops. There is the hard copy book, which is the most common. The primary way to seek God and be acquainted with Him is by delving into His Word. Prayer is not the way to seek God you have to know him first by searching the Bible. As long as you are literate, you can learn the truth about God by reading his written word. Look at the book of Romans at 15.4. For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. You see, you will never know and appreciate the exploits of God in the past through the lives of ordinary men and women like you and me if they were not written. You will not know how God planned and accomplished your salvation through Jesus Christ if he had not inspired men to create it. God wants you to know him and he made the Bible available for your learning. 
Furthermore, in the Bible, you will find comfort in the accounts of men and women who faced challenges many years ago that are similar to what you face today. When you know the ways of God, then you can rightly call upon Him. The Word of God will abound you in your heart as you give it consistent attention, and this is what God wants. The book of Colossians 3, verse 16, puts it so simply, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. When this happens, you will realize that you have grown acquainted with the thoughts of God on a variety of issues. Then, if problems arise, you won't be completely in the dark, even if you can't solve them right away. There is something very fundamental that God wants you to do with his words, and the book of Joshua 1 verse 8 says it plainly. This book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. There is awesome power in speaking the word of God over your life and circumstances. But you may not appreciate this if you do not know the characteristics of the word of God. Consider the book of Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Here's another one in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. From the last two Bible references above, you can know what to expect when you declare the word of God over your life. It is a mighty weapon that shatters everything contrary to the will of God in your life. Again, look at the book of Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If you receive prophetic words, be excited and give God praise for it. But do not stop there. Go further and speak such words over your life continually. Release the word of God against the challenges. This is so important because Satan will fight the word given to you. He knows that he is helpless against any Christian who has a word from God with respect to any situation. This is what Jesus meant by saying that persecution arises for the word's sake. The aim of Satan is to render the word of God ineffective, and he does it by casting doubt in your mind. He also shows you things you can see in a bid to convince you that the word of God does not work. The way you should respond to this is boldly and even loudly. Counter Satan's lies by speaking out the word of God. Declaring the word of God produces results, but this will not always be instant. There is no such thing as God's sword did not work. You need to be fully persuaded 
that God cannot lie. His word is the truth under all circumstances. God and his word are one. He would be a failure if his word did not work, but you need to have the right word for any challenge, and it is the Holy Spirit that gives it to you in your time of fellowship. It can come as you meditate on a scripture. It can even come as you listen to a message or a sermon in church. The right word of God is otherwise known as Rima. When you have it, do not let go because it is your answer. Do not let anything stop you from consistently declaring God's word. This was what God told Joshua from the onset of his assignment. It does not matter how you feel. Faith has nothing to do with how you feel. It has everything to do with God's word. Decide that the word of God in your mouth will be your first response to any challenge before you do anything else. Give priority to the word of God because there is a tendency for you to come under pressure in the face of challenges and you will be tempted to complain. Do not wait for crisis time. Train yourself to habitually speak the word of God. The spoken word of God is both a defensive as well as an attacking weapon. Satan is constantly seeking to dominate your mind with negative suggestions. In the same vein, God seeks to align your thinking with his. Naturally, God's thoughts are higher than man's. But by voicing out God's word always, you stay on par with God and keep Satan at bay. The anointed young man David approached Goliath the giant with God's word in his mouth. Jesus withstood Satan with the spoken word of God. It is a proven principle that works. You can't be neutral with your words. You are either in agreement with God or in agreement with Satan. There is ongoing spiritual warfare that you need to be aware of. You need to be defensive and attack as well. You can never anticipate where and when Satan will attack. Your mouth is not meant for eating and drinking alone. You need it to chart a good future for yourself. By speaking from his imagination, God created heaven and the earth. You can also imagine things and make them happen by declaring the word of God. You cannot afford to wait for things to change. Initiate the change with the spoken word of God through your lips. The will of God for your life will not come to pass automatically just because you know it. It must come out of your mouth. God has given you the authority to order your life, and you do it primarily by speaking his words. This is the way to receiving healing and answers to prayer. The words spoken to you are not as powerful as the ones you speak. Your words have huge implications in the realms of the spirit. Negative words expressing fear, hate, or anger can activate demons, but angels respond to the spoken word of God. If you find it difficult to keep speaking God's word, it is because you have not been meditating on it. You have unconsciously allowed circumstances to govern your thinking, but you can do something about this. Start taking advantage of every opportunity to receive the word of God. Your phone and car stereo can effectively serve this purpose. Regulate listening to the news media and listening to the music you listen to. You cannot take charge of your life without taking charge of your words. God has forgiven you. Declare it. God has made you righteous. Declare it. God has redeemed you. Declare it. God has made you holy. Declare it. God has blessed you. Declare it. Everything God has done for you in Christ Jesus finds expression in your life through your declaration of it. It is not enough for you to know them and remain silent. If you do not say who you are, Satan will tell you who you are not. If you do not say what you have, 
Satan will tell you what you do not have. And if you do not say what you can do, he will tell you what you cannot do. Men can rate you based on your appearance, wealth, education, or family background. But the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, you are worth the blood of Jesus. See yourself in Christ and say it to yourself every day before stepping out of your house. The Word of God gives you a positive image of yourself. God is for you, in you, and with you. You have everything you require to overcome the challenges of life. God has not left you defenseless. Discover what you have in Christ Jesus through His Word. You are a victor, not a victim. You are more than a conqueror, and this has always led to your victory.